to our show sponsors Profitable Practices, Real Ag Shops, and Atoma Canada. While other sources of innovation run dry and fail to understand your needs, Atoma is here to deliver, and we're all in on you. Talk to your Atoma sales rep today. Welcome, everyone, to The Agronomist. I am your host, Lindsay Smith, and thank you so much for joining me. This is my, I'm pretty sure, once a year uh, episode I'm allowed to do with a forage focus. So here it is. I'm super excited. Uh, thanks to everyone who's uh, already hopped on in the chat. Uh, great to hear uh, from everybody. We've got uh, BC represented there with Kevin, uh, Canadian Cowman's there. We've got Ray out in Calgary. Uh, and uh, I know Paisley's watching, even if he's not going to show up in the comments. So hello, Paisley. Uh, a quick reminder for everybody. Yes, please do hop in on the comments. Let us know uh, where you're listening from and, and how things look where you are. And if you do collect those CEU credits, head on over to realagriculture.com slash agronomists uh, tomorrow. Let us know you watch the episode and we'll get you those CEU credits. Next week, we're going to be talking uh, corn diseases, specifically gibberella, but we'll touch on some tar spot and uh, northern corn leaf blight as well. So uh, put that in your calendars. All right. Without further ado, oh, hi, Jay. Jason is here from Manto as well. All right. Without further ado, let's bring in my guest. I've got Christine O'Reilly here from Omafra and Dan Understander, uh, Understander, Professor Emeritus from the University of Wisconsin. Right, Dan? Is that the title or do you do you prefer a different one? No, that's good. I'll right. answer it almost anything. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. All right. And I do apologize a, a little bit. Um, I may be muting myself a lot. I've caught some sort of kettle cloth here. So uh, we'll do our best. Um, I'll start with you, Christine. Uh, you, of course, a, a couple hours away from where I am. We're based here in Ontario. Uh, but what has the season held where you are? Yeah, um, it's it's been a bit of extremes in some ways. Uh, spring in a lot of Ontario was actually very dry and that has impacted some of the hay that's already been put up. And then I would say for maybe up, up to about the last month, we've been getting very frequent rain. So while first cut came off in great shape and in good time, um, depending, depending on where you are, first, second or third cut, you might be on right now. Awesome. And that's been a challenge because of frequent rainfall. Um, and I have heard that, I have heard from some of my colleagues in the Maritimes that it's been a very wet growing season for them as well. So east of the Great Lakes has been pretty wet, at least lately. Um, and I think early, wet wet spring in the Maritimes, wet recently in Ontario. Yeah, absolutely. Um, now, Dan, you're with the University, or we're with the University of Wisconsin, still based there. And you did mention before we hopped on, it's been dry. So what kind of growing season uh, have you had? Well, it's uh, always a mix, a little bit like Christine uh, commented on. Uh, the northern half of the state has been fairly wet. Uh, the southern half of the state has seen some of the worst drought that we've seen in many years. Uh, I, For those of you that grow hay, I think this is going to be an issue because we're basically in a drought mode from every place west of the Mississippi. Uh, except uh, uh, up to the Canadian border, and we'll probably hear from some up there, but I think many of you are pretty hot and dry too in the West. Yeah, absolutely. So Ray is sharing, he's near, uh, or he's in Calgary. So right now sitting about 95, 98, and it has been dry. Manitoba's had a very odd year. Jason, maybe you can share. Um, but uh, Kyler here <laughs> mentioning in Ontario, we, uh, we, we cut once and wash the hay several times um and christine you did mention <laughs> where you know you've got first second third cut uh you may have all three going um this is the first time i think i've ever seen this in ontario where the same field um is like still got maybe second cut and maybe still has first cut cut done maybe second cut but only half the field are you seeing uh, this too i haven't been hearing of much of that this year, but 2017 was wet and we had a lot yes. of, okay, we're yep. doing first and second and third cut in the same all field all at once because yep. you'd start and then it would start raining again. Yeah, that's us here. That's I'm here in the east and it is it is rough. So uh, Kevin Kevin is out. So that's Canadian Cowman. He's out in BC. Uh, he's saying that uh, no water restrictions yet. Uh, farm irrigation is running um, 
lawn watering is banned, but it is the driest he's seen it. They've had three inches of rain since May. Now for parts of Alberta or Saskatchewan, that might be fine. But for where Kevin's from, that is incredibly rare. So Dan, uh, you mentioned, of course, that that even the state half is dry and half is, is not so bad. Um, how dire of a situation do you think we're in as far as uh, hay supplies through the winter with how widespread this drought is? Well, let me start with uh, one of the colleagues I have in Amarillo talked about having a four inch rain, one drop every four inches. Right. That'll do it. <laughs> and that's the way that's the way about uh, the other side of it is, and, and this is considered to be a part of global warming. Those areas that have gotten raid, the fronts are hanging on longer. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing actual, we're going from the extreme of drought to flooding in a number of areas around Denver and parts of California and some other areas. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're bouncing back and forth. Um, in terms of total hay supply, at this point, um, <laughs> I just see somebody here said it's so dry in Wisconsin, the cheese will be in limited supply. <laughs> I see that too. We're getting down to the very important things. Yes. As long cheese. as the breweries keep operating, we're doing okay. <laughs> I think Ray would agree. Yeah, I think so. Um, anyway, I really have no good idea of how much hay production is going to be down uh, because it is so variable across the region. But I do think an estimate of a 30 to 40 percent reduction in hay production is not unusual. You do see we've cut a number of our cow herds uh, and beef cattle herds in anticipation of lack of winter feed. And so... Uh, I think uh, we're we're going to see shortages. We're going to see continued high prices. Uh, the flip side is there's going to be a good market for those that have hay. Yeah. Now, Christine, we had here in Ontario, last year was a good year for hay overall. Um, I Certainly for our area anyway, we've got a lot still in storage. Um, but then there were other areas that were super dry. So... Has that equaled out a bit this year with some areas getting much better rain? Um, yes. <laughs> and and even, so even your comments trying to generalize, Ontario is a big province. Like I it's was getting calls place. last year. Yeah. Grant County was dry. Around Guelph was dry. Wellington. So, um, yeah. So I know Eastern Ontario last year, a lot of people put up first cut and went, I don't know where I'm going to put the rest. Like it was fantastic yields last year and i know very strong yields in the east for first cut again this year in eastern ontario um i i think the southwest is having a bit more of a normal year what whatever normal means um, whatever normal just, is Great. just just because i'm not hearing about extremes in either way right so people yeah. seem to be comfortable but not ecstatic about uh the yields that they were getting i think the most unusual thing to happen this year though is how early first cut started um, yes. yeah. so we had a very dry spring in a lot of Ontario and corn went in in good time, beans went in in good time. And a lot of producers finished those jobs, looked at the forecast, went, wow, it looks fantastic. It's a little early, but forget, let's cut some hay. Like we can't pass up a window this good. And, um, that actually has led to some complications. So because the crop was so much less mature than it normally is when we make dry hay, um, even though in many cases it was left to wilt for a full seven days it did not get rained on like it came out of yeah. the field looking beautiful it felt dry it probe tested dry if you probe test your bales but because that crop was less mature it held on to stem moisture much more tighter than it does in june and so within the first two weeks of june i was getting a lot of calls about hay heating and storage that seemed dry even even with acid applied to it as a preservative just because some producers knew may hay can be a bit tricky um, yeah, it just the conditions, the hay was heating in storage and the highest yeah. risk for spontaneous combustion in hay is the first three months in storage. It can happen anytime during the year, but the first three months is the biggest risk. So, uh, we are halfway through August. So two more weeks of like high alert, checking the temperature on any yeah. May hay daily, like daily, cause it can start heating fast. Um, but yeah, we're, we're almost out of the highest risk 
time for for that crop but it's it's been pretty tense because um yeah it looked beautiful and it never got rained on but it just wasn't as dry as it, wasn't it as dry. felt yeah dan when we when we talk about hay and storage and and spontaneous combustion and like christine says of checking it how much of a especially if it went in a little tough i think that we're we're used to checking on it but do we get complacent when the hay goes in nice and dry and we think think we're okay should we still be checking on it uh, well, I think a lot of people uh, get complacent when they've seen it time and again. Um, Christine might have a, a response to this, but we've seen some of the same. The only thing I will say is we aren't getting many reports of hay barn fires. I've seen two or three come across, and that tells me that um, the worrying is appropriate. Uh, mm -hmm. Part of the reason, <laughs> I guess, that <clears throat> I don't, pay as much attention to that as I might, is that once you got the hay in a pile or in a barn, there isn't too much you're going to do about it, except pray. And uh, yeah. I always tell farmers, make sure their insurance is up to date. Mm -hmm. But um, frankly, when it gets real hot, if you try to tear the pile apart, you're likely to start a fire if uh, there isn't one in there. So uh, the best thing to do is try to be really cautious uh, when you put it in. Use acid, as Christine suggested. Um, these are the kinds of years, though, when a wrap baleage is probably a really good idea. Uh, mm -hmm. I would suggest that, uh, in fact, let me just go out. I'm old, so I can go out on a limb. <laughs> <laughs> and one, one of my approaches is that Whenever the hay is, of quote, normal, wrapping is probably a good idea. <laughs> mm. And uh, we're talking about preserving the quality. We're talking about preserving the tonnage. But also we're talking about avoiding fires. And they do happen. Yeah. Yeah. And this year, I think, Christine, to that point, we've certainly seen more, certainly some straw fires as well. I've, I've heard about the straw is getting rained on and then... Uh, bailed up. Um, we've had very hot temps, very humid temps. Uh, so absolutely. Um, and and Dan, I'm glad you mentioned that pulling it apart because Christine, you did uh, you shared an article earlier this year when we were having reports of hay heating, even though it came off quote unquote dry. Um, I didn't realize, but that introduction of, of oxygen. So if you were trying to move hay or, or tear it apart, that can actually cause combustion if it was yeah. close. So that's super if scary. If we have any volunteer firefighters listening, like they, they'll know this already, but for everybody else, uh, there's yeah. what they call the fire triangle. So there's three things. Sorry, I'm trying to like myself the, up here. So those who are watching can see it. There are three yeah. things that you need <laughs> yeah, to actually go. start a fire. You need fuel. And I'm not mm -hmm. talking fuel like when we think of like the engines on our farm equipment. I'm talking like just something that will burn, right? So the hay right. in this case is the fuel. You need heat and you need oxygen. So when we have either damp hay or dry silage, because you can get a fire in a silo too. It's, it's way more unusual and it's way more complicated to put out, but it can happen. So anytime you've got forage in that like 25 to 40% moisture range, there's still space for oxygen in that storage, mm. but it's wet enough that microbes are still doing their thing. They're, they're living their microbial lives and that produces some heat. And so you can actually get um, this, this heating from just microbial respiration in the hay. And once that heating happens, if it hits a certain temperature, then there's a chemical reaction that happens called the Maillard reaction. And this is the same thing that happens when you're toasting a marshmallow and it gets all brown and crispy on the outside. That's the Maillard reaction. Same thing as grill marks on your steak, right? All of that lovely, delicious browning, that's the Maillard reaction. It can happen in your hay as well. Now, your nutritionist doesn't like it because it denatures all of the sugars and it also denatures protein and makes that less available. So we don't want to see it in forage, even though it's delicious in our own food. But that Maillard reaction can become self-sustaining. So it's hot and it starts burning up your sugars and breaking down your proteins and it just keeps heating, heating, heating. Then you add the third piece to the equation, oxygen, so air. And that's when you get this spontaneous combustion. So it's those three pieces of fuel, 
heat and oxygen that cause a fire. Ray, uh, Ray hops in and says, perhaps a future session on combine and harvest and bin fires uh, as well. And I would absolutely agree. This is one of those times where um, fire safety is just so important and, uh, and bin spoilage, even if it's not a fire, bin spoilage. Although, so interesting, I've, I've certainly seen uh, silos or seen reports of silos exploding. Um, Dan, what are the conditions that we need to worry about in siled hay uh, as far as heating or combustion? Well, it's actually the same as a baled hay pile. Uh, we need uh, high enough temperature. We need substrate, as Christine suggested, and then it starts. And uh, of course, growing up here uh, in the old tower silos that more of us used to use, I have seen a number of those. and. And frankly, what they just have to do is let them burn for a month or two until mm -hmm. uh, it's burned out because you can't go in and take it out anymore in most cases. And so, yeah, it, all you can do is feel your silo. And if your silo is hot, you should worry. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, I I did hear a friend of mine is, is on, on a fire... Uh, volunteer fire team um, and they had a straw fire that they were going to see and same idea they basically they you really just contain it and let it burn out you don't actually try and put it out you just try and make sure that it doesn't um, necessarily spread anywhere else and then somebody um, you know a couple of them then stay and babysit it until it burns down which is really devastating uh, and Kevin shares that they've had bunker bunker silos that have gone um, and, and so Kevin says, several years, drought stressed corn, rainfall before chopping, causing nitrates to accumulate in the plant. Oh, Kevin, you have hit on a couple of things that I want to talk about, because tonight we are talking about, uh, and we're, we're just going to, we're going to throw to a clip here quickly so Christine can fix her video, because she looks very terrified. Um, but uh, <laughs> we can hear you fine, Christine. Uh, but uh, I do want to talk about a few of those quality parameters. We have touched on, of course, uh, proteins and sugars in caramelized hay uh, being denatured, but I really want to talk about stressed crops, um, whether that's drought or rainfall, whatever those things may be, and how it impacts quality, because Ray, actually you are right. Uh, quality hay makes milk and milk makes cheese. So if we don't have quality hay, we will run out of cheese. So this is incredibly important. Okay, so, but before uh, before we get to that discussion, I do wanna talk about uh, the nutrition in hay as far as what we feed the soil to feed the crop. Um, and so I've pulled a throwback. This is from about 10 years ago. And uh, this is a conversation I had with Glenn Friesen out in Manitoba talking about uh, fertilizing hay and uh, what a hay crop pulls out of the ground. And I wanna sort of update this, but uh, Jay, if you can run the clip. Uh, it's very important to fertilize your hay fields if you consider that most of the nutrients removed in a field uh, or from an acre of land are in the stem and leaves of a plant and if you're removing hay crops that's where the bulk of the nutrients are going. For example when you compare a cereal silage stand to a, a grain field uh, you're removing up to 50 percent more nitrogen and, and phosphorus and up to 400 percent more potassium and 100 percent more sulfur. So a big number is coming off a hay crop. And if you consider the, uh, the amount of nutrients removed in a ton of alfalfa, um, you're at about 60 pounds of nitrogen, uh, also about 60 pounds of potassium, 15 of phosphorus, and about six of sulfur. So a lot of nutrients coming off your hay crop uh, each year, and that's in one ton. The average yield of alfalfa for Manitoba is somewhere in the range of two to four tons, sometimes as high as five, depending on where you are. Uh, so that can translate into about $50 a, a ton in fertilizer without counting the nitrogen. If you include the nitrogen, you're upwards of $77 a ton, just in the value of the nutrients in the bale. Okay, so any recommendations for timing uh, or type? and uh, application um, means? Uh, it, it's for grasses, your main focus will be on, on nitrogen um, and uh, potassium. Um, phosphorus is, is, is important. Um, and for alfalfa, we're really going to focus on, on your phosphorus and potassium. Um, if you're going to apply those, it's best to apply them together. There has been studies shown that when applied together, there's a bit of synergy happening. So you actually do get improved yields when you have combined nutrients. 
Um, the first thing, of course, the most important thing to do is a soil test and see where your soils are at. Uh, it's really just a shot in the dark if you're not sure what levels you've had in your field for the last number of years. Uh, a bare minimum of at least once every two or three years uh, of soil testing is recommended. Um, as far as timing is concerned, uh, well, we're, we're thinking ideally a spring application for nitrogen to get, uh, get your grasses going. Uh, in the case of alfalfa, I see most people putting their phosphorus and potassium down after the, between the first and second cut. And the largest challenge there is that the soil is often a little bit soft to get on it first thing in spring and you want to be careful about damaging those, those, uh, those crowns. So uh, between the first and second is a good place to start. Um, uh, what many do on, in the case of phosphorus is get loaded, preloaded onto the stand before you actually seed it. And uh, that allows you to put two or three years, maybe four years of, of, of nutrients on ahead of time. Of course, that's uh, making sure you're within your uh, nutrient application regulations. The Agronomist is brought to you by Adama Canada, Profitable Practices and Real Egg Shops. Real Ag Shops is a new video series brought to you by Princess Auto. In this series, check out smart and slick shops from across Canada. Do you know someone who has a great shop? Nominate them for a tour by emailing shaney at realagriculture.com. Ah yes, Real Ag Shops. All right. There's, a, there's an episode up already. I highly recommend everybody go check it out. It's super cool. Um, okay, <clears throat> excusez-moi. Um, let's talk numbers just a bit. Now, Christine um, has vexed me, I think, because I asked her to do math. And so I apologize. But Dan, maybe, so maybe I'll start with you, Dan. What do you think of those numbers? I think one of the things that we always talk about when we talk hay is, remember, you're taking the whole plant, right? You're taking stem, leaf, everything, buds maybe. Um, what what do we think of those numbers? Way too low? Maybe ignore the price per ton or whatever, but do we need to update those 10 years out? No, um, I think the plant really hasn't changed that much in nutrient uptake, except as yield has increased in some areas. Um, and so we should pay attention to nutrient removal per ton and as long as we do so, the numbers are about the same as they were 20 or 30 years ago. There are two additional thoughts I'd like to throw out quickly. Um, one is that we're realizing we need to add sulfur almost all over, <coughs> unless there's sulfur in the irrigation water. Uh, since we've cleaned up the acid rain, we're now needing sulfur. And uh, I think Glenn mentioned this, but Basically, the thought would be five or six pounds of sulfur removal per ton of forage, irregardless of the crop, whether it's alfalfa or grass or corn silage. Corn grain removes very little, but corn silage removes the same as all the other forages. So um, I think that uh, we can soil test and some areas don't need it, but what we're seeing, frankly, is that the need is so broad that most people should at least be thinking about it. If they're not applying, they might do a tissue test to determine if they need it. Um, I'd like you to consider some labs do a soil test for sulfur and it's worthless. But, you know, <laughs> I like Christine, it. I can say stuff like that. <laughs> you can say whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Christine, I'm, your I'm thoughts on we I'm smiling because in Ontario, we don't do sulfur recommendations on the soil test because sulfur is like nitrogen. It moves a lot in the soil. Exactly. So right. I'm not disagreeing with you, Dan. I just wouldn't have put it quite so bluntly. <laughs> <laughs> he can. So there you go. He can. It's just fine. He's yeah. retired. He can say what he wants. <laughs> That's right. But we do know certainly what, there, is, what, there, is a good, there is a high sulfur need compared to, to other crops for sure. Go ahead, Dan. The the last thing is, uh, I do think we should really think about the uh, benefit to corn, particularly in Ontario, of turning over an alfalfa field. So I'm really promoting that. Uh, what we see is that if your, uh, your legume credits are usually about enough for either corn grain or corn silage, so with the price of nitrogen, you can save a few hundred dollars per acre. And then we do see generally about a 20 percent yield increase of corn grown on alfalfa plow down land 
And uh, when I sum all those things together, we're talking about a three or $400 contribution towards corn production in fertilizer savings and yield increases. And I think we should think about that and not necessarily think about trying to keep an alfalfa field a year longer. Mm. I, Dan, I, I didn't even ask more. you to, sure. I was gonna say, I didn't even I, ask him to say that, put in the plug for forages <laughs> and rotation, but there you go. Go ahead, Christine. I was, I was gonna say, I can add one more reason to rotate alfalfa and corn is we are starting to see BT resistant corn rootworm in Ontario. Um, but those rootworms don't feed on alfalfa roots. So if you have a predominantly alfalfa stand, that's a great way to break up the life cycle and knock those rootworm populations down. So um, we could go down that rabbit hole, but I'll just I'll just leave it there because I think we want to talk about fertilizer. <laughs> we do we do it so, well. I mean, I think we've got it. We've got a good picture here, but it is definitely a consideration and something in Ontario that we're seeing more of. Uh, Dan, go ahead. <clears throat> well, I was going to say is in the eastern half of the United States. Uh, and I think Canada too, uh, we're generally trying for four year stands of alfalfa. And I think that's a mistake. We've pushed it to three. And frankly, right now with the economics, I think we should be considering two year stands of alfalfa oh, because of the benefit the to corn. Seed. The seed costs so much. <laughs> okay, okay, but, but Lindsay, because I hear, I hear this argument well, regularly, it, but Lindsay, it hurts how, my heart. how but just think much a minute. is alfalfa seed the, per acre? Give me a number. The seed cost is around one hundred and forty dollars per acre in the U.S. That's okay. The benefit to corn is four hundred and fifty dollars per acre. It shouldn't take a rocket scientist to figure out where the benefit is. So one hundred and forty U.S. That, is like four hundred Canadian. Pretty close. I'm not good with math. What about <laughs> anyway? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah. the The other thing that. Uh, I encourage people to think about in those uh, rotational things. So we do have the benefit that Christine mentioned, plus what I mentioned, but also uh, do consider that on the uh, faster turnaround, we have less yield reduction in older stands. Mm -hmm. And and I'll just throw this out quickly because this will be an issue for a lot of portions of Canada and the United States this year. Alfalfa that was seeded this spring in a drought is never going to yield very well. No. That I have what seen we have seen time. over the yeah. years is that drought and insects in the seeding year and a number of other things hurt the yield of that alfalfa stand forevermore. And uh, so I'm going to be recommending a lot of farmers turn their stands over after next year simply because they're not getting the yields that they'd like and they never will. Mm -hmm. It's unfortunate and I hate to say that, but I think we need to be pretty straightforward. So Christine, I think you're you're I think you're right. Your image is frozen again, but I think we can hear you fine. And Warren, I will send a shout out. Warren is very pleased because he just hopped on and our forage discussion is centering on corn and the benefit to corn. And that makes Warren's cash crop hearts <laughs> grow three sizes. Um, but okay, Christine, if you are there. Yep, I'm here. I, the what do you, what say you? Three years is enough for alfalfa? Four? too much so are you on side the, with two where should we go <laughs> the the guidelines that i tend to share with producers is not the number of years it's the number of cuts because okay. cutting is a stressor right and and yep. just th this part aligns with what dan has been saying which is we want to keep our cost per ton low right cost per acre it matters, but it's cost per ton that's going to make or break on a livestock operation. Feed is your biggest expense. I don't care what type of ruminant you're raising. So um, if you can keep your cost per ton low, that means you need to keep your yield potential high. So if we're looking at lifetime number of cuts, the guidelines that I've been seeing tend to be 9 to 12 cuts. So for example, a lot of Ontario farms are three cut systems. They're aiming for three cuts a year. If you spring seed that alfalfa stand and you take one cut off it in the establishment year, that's one. For the next three years, you're taking three cuts, right? Three yeah. cuts first year, three cuts second, three cuts third. You've now hit a lifetime total of 10 cuts. I don't care how good the stand is, take it out. 
because now you've stressed it with those 10 cuttings. It's gone through a few winters. It's been exposed to insects, potato leaf hopper, alfalfa weevil. Um, there's disease, there's leaf spot in the bottom. Like it's, it's now going to have a harder time fighting off those things and your yield potential is coming down. So even if it looks good, nine to 12 cuts, take it off. Now that number starts to look different if you are, say, a dairy farmer in the southern part of Oxford County and you're gunning for five cuts in a good year, right? Right. If you get one cut in the establishment year and five cuts the next two production years, you're at 11 cuts. Take it out. Already. And to Dan's point, it's not like there isn't a benefit to what you put in next, which would likely be corn. Um, so it, as Ray points out, and I will say that this does exist, the seven to 10 year old stands um, that some farmers have, um, and Ray says, and with growers asking what's wrong? Well, I don't think alfalfa stands were meant to last 10 years. Um, let's face it, I don't care how much. I like that concept though, Christine, of thinking about, thinking about it, not so much even in years, but in cuts. And also Dan, to your point, um, on this farm that I'm on, there was an alfalfa, there was a field established during uh, the very dry season of 2016. It never caught up. And probably the smartest thing would have been to pull the pin sooner rather than later and and get back to something that was going to actually be viable within the two years. But that in trying so hard to establish during a drought, just it just never comes back from it. Uh, I think you're right. Now, uh, Jason has a great question. To try and summarize this, uh, for maximum tonnage and quality, the best strategy for uh, for fertilizer for alfalfa, do we go all up front? Do we do that in between each cut? Let's say this is established. Let's say we're in second or third year. Dan, what strategy have you found uh, for, for, for fertility that has worked best? Well, we recommend, uh, first of all, a split application because even with a three ton yield, uh, that's too much potassium to put on at one time. Uh, the other thing is with a split application, um, if you put it all on at one time, the plant takes up everything that's there. And that's when you get high levels of potassium in your alfalfa and, and other issues. So particularly for both potassium and sulfur, there's value in a split. And I recommend the first uh, cutting uh, after uh, the first application after first cutting. I don't like to see it early in the spring because the ground's too soft and you leave wheel tracks and damage the stand. And then you can harvest uh, hopefully at least three cuttings. And after the third cutting, put on your the remainder of your application, which would be an amount equivalent to the sulfur and potassium that you had removed in the hay that you harvested. Uh, that then gives you a good nutrient level going into the winter to help winter survival. And it gives you enough nutrient for first cutting in the spring that you don't have to drive over it when the ground is soft. So a split application uh, reduces salt injury. A split application uh, provides a more efficiency of fertilizer use because you don't have as much luxury consumption by the plant. The only exception to that would be uh, heavy grass stands. Uh, those will sh need a shot of nitrogen every time you want them to grow. And so grasses mm -hmm. would be every cutting. <laughs> so needy. Yeah. Now, Christine, Dan brings up a good point about traveling across the field not wanting to obviously compact or make ruts, but also potentially driving over crowns and, and injuring those plants. So I know, I think on Twitter or whatever we're supposed to call it now, earlier this season, we talked about, you know, taking off bales and, or uh, I think it was grazing, putting the animals on and, and doing a quick graze across. How important is it to think about that regrowth on that crown right after you've done a haying pass and get that hay out of the field? It's very important. Um, we, there, I think it was Chris Brown, uh, with Omafra did some work on wheel traffic damage and it can be significant. So this is a, in some ways, this is a bigger problem in dry hay production mm -hmm. because you need to let that crop wilt for like a week and then yeah. bail it up and, and take it off the field. So you have a longer time between cutting and everything being out of the field 
uh, than you do with a bailage or a haylage situation. But um, within three to five days, those crowns can start sending up new shoots. And when you drive over those new shoots, you break them off. So then the plant has to start either from auxiliary buds lower down on the stem or from the, the crown itself sending up shoots. So you're going to have the fields, the parts of your field that you didn't drive on are going to be more mature and also have more growth on them than the parts of the field that you did drive on. And we don't tend to have controlled traffic systems on a hay field. So even, even if you look yeah. at studies of like no controlled traffic in a grain field, you'll traffic like 60% of the field over the course of a season. Um, on a hay field, you'll track over 90% of that field. So like you, you're, you are damaging that growth and that can impact yield um, and have various quality throughout the field for your next cut. Mm -hmm. Well, just think about loading wagons and things to get it out of the field, right? Like you just drive over so much more of the field. Go ahead, Dan. There, there are two things about that that uh, might keep in mind. One is we did some studies a few years ago uh, cutting with a 10-foot cutter bar to 13-foot cutter bar because you had less traffic the wider the cutter bar. And we found that we were getting an extra ton of hay just by going to the wider cutter bar in the field. Uh, wow. And that was the reducing wheel traffic damage. Uh, the other thing that I wanted to say quickly, um, well, two things in the comments column, uh, Ray's comment about phosphorus up front and K and sulfur annually. And I agree 100% with that. I think he's right on target. And then Janet's comment about organic farmers say it takes two years of alfalfa to grow corn. And um, and that's true. It takes a little while to get the alfalfa to establish. But that's why I'm advocating a two-year <coughs> rotation with alfalfa. Because <laughs> that's what it takes to grow a crop. All right. Uh, great question from Jason as well. And Christine, I'll, I'll start with you on this one. Certainly seeing leafhopper here um, in Ontario. So... He says, uh, not a common thing in Manitoba anyway, to control uh, pest populations, insect pests. Uh, so what is the advantage or what is the benefit to controlling, let's say, ligus, aphid, alfalfa seed weevil? Um, here in Ontario, I mean, obviously Ontario, but when we think about insects, I think sometimes people forget that alfalfa actually can be impacted by, significantly impacted by insects. Yeah, so... I'm on the other side of the Great Lakes from you, Jason. I've got a different suite of insects that I'm worried about. I think the only one on your list that I've ever been asked about by a producer in Ontario is aphids. And we're not really worried about aphids in alfalfa just because you would need hundreds per stem to be an economic level I feel like problem. You're just daring Mother Nature. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay, <laughs> knock on wood right now. Knocking yeah, on the desk. Um, but no, we, we yeah. don't have thresholds for aphids. They do spread some plant diseases, which is right. in interesting from a plant health perspective. But again, like how much economic damage does alfalfa mosaic virus cause? I don't know that anyone's looked at that, although Dan probably knows better. Um, so the ones that I end up talking about every year, um, around first cut, uh, there are parts of southwestern Ontario that every year are watching for alfalfa weevil. Um, so it's feeding on buds and leaves. You get the skeletonized look and thresholds really depend on how tall the plant is. So um, cutting early is the main recommendation, but if you've got a lot of weevil larvae that are still actively feeding on the regrowth that will become your second cut, then sometimes it does justify an insecticide. Um, the other big one for Ontario is potato leaf hopper. So these ones don't overwinter. They blow in with storm fronts from the southern U.S. Uh, so we don't tend to see them arrive until late May, early June when we get those thunderstorms. This year they showed up late because we didn't get thunderstorms till later than normal. Um, but yeah, they often get confused as drought. Like they oh, suck the juice out of the leaves of the plant and then they're, they're insects. So it's not really spit, but they're spit mimics plant hormones and closes off the vascular system in the plant. So water can't come up from the roots and sugar doesn't go down. And my camera just froze again. Oh, and that is um, like the best. The I'm best gonna face. This one, I'm sorry. I've, <laughs> I've so not startled. until now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but anyway, so that's what's um, going to happen. Yeah. With, with the leaf hoppers, um, 
they're they're very small so you do have to get out in the field with a sweep net and actually sweep to do counts because again the threshold changes depending on how tall the alfalfa is cutting is still our main control method because if you take away their food right. source the population crashes um, but the number of times when i hear farmers say oh no like that field's just dry it's an established alfalfa field it's got a big tap root so if your corn isn't pineappling and your beans look fine and your wheat's still great like yeah. it's not drought guys it's leaf hoppers so those are the those yeah. are the two big ones um the third one that i'll mention this is the last one i'm going to mention is um alfalfa snout beetle is a problem east of kingston in ontario i don't know how far into quebec it's a problem um but that one can resemble winter kill but it tends to be the tops of knolls instead of the bottoms of hollows it has a cute name but i kind of hate it so yeah. there you go yeah. Yeah. Okay. We have um, only about 15 minutes left of the show. This has gone by so quickly and that's so not fair. Um, although I am going to do a quick break for uh, our last thank you to our sponsors so that Christine can reset her camera again. Um, although you could just keep this look. It really <laughs> uh, if you really wanted to. <laughs> but, uh, Producer Jay, if you could run uh, our last read uh, for the night. Thank you to our sponsors tonight, Adama Canada, Real Ag Shops, and Profitable Practices. Profitable Practices on Real Agriculture is a video series featuring Canadian producers who are adopting farm practices to have a positive impact on profit, people, and the planet. Profitable Practices is made possible by support from Farm Credit Canada and RBC Royal Bank. Find out more at realagriculture.com slash profitable hyphen practices. Quick note, uh, I will be on Profitable Practices in a couple weeks, and that makes me very happy. All right, uh, Christine, I hope is coming back. I think she's going to. Dan, I want to, in this last segment, I want to really focus on, um, so Kevin says, I'll just stick with orchard grass. Thank you, alfalfa sounds challenging. So Kevin would be one of those that is getting many, many cuts for his dairy. Uh, alfalfa does, alfalfa is very challenging, and it is expensive. Um, but you're right, it grows great corn. Okay, let's talk about some of the challenges that weather can throw at us. We often, as Christina said, and she's going to cover quite a bit, we often think about rain being the enemy. Um, and we want to get that crop in and bailed and either wrapped or in the silo or in the bag as fast as possible. Um, but Dan, there's, there's always we do get the questions about what about stress the other way. So drought stress, Okay, so drought does lower tonnage, but do we need to worry or are there certain species that we need to worry about? Um, let's say with nitrates come to mind, those sorts of things. What do we need to worry about under uh, drought stress conditions? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so first, actually, I think we should follow up with your weather and insects a little bit because oh, uh, sure. the drought has drought has made uh, just see the last comment about grasshoppers um and uh they'll also uh, make weevils a lot not weevils and uh, uh potato leaf hopper a lot worse if it doesn't rain so i oftentimes get called to some field as drought stress and then a farmer and we've got a potato leaf hopper problem and the farmer says well should i spray or not and um uh, I oftentimes recommend spraying because that will also affect the next growth to some extent. But we have uh, we've had tremendous problems. Uh, uh, Christine from Wisconsin across to uh, Nebraska, we've had people have to spray uh, alfalfa weevil three and four times on first cutting. Oh. And so uh, one of my most common topics is what can we do to minimize that? So. We are thinking about that. Uh, actually, it's one of the reasons that some farmers are starting to take late fall cuttings instead of leaving residue because the weevils lay their eggs in the stem. And if we cut them off, we remove those stems and we also remove the insulation and uh, kill quite a few, not all of them. But if we can get the load down to 20 or 30 percent of what it was last year, that's a big deal. Um, so the other question was uh, about uh, weather and the crop. Um, 
for that. You know, the good news is that alfalfa comes back continuously. And so you're going to have some periods of dry weather, of flooding, and of, we all have horror stories where it went on for months and multiple cuttings, but most often it's one or two, and then we get one or two good cuttings. So I think it's important to keep that thought in mind. Um, the other thing is in terms of toxic compounds, alfalfa really doesn't have any toxic compounds from drought. Uh, sometimes in flooding, I get a little bit worried about it. People don't think a little bit about where did the water that flooded the field come from? And did it go across manure piles and then drag in uh, organisms that will affect the animals eating that forage? But short of that, flooding isn't that big of an issue. We'll have some phytophthora a few places, but not otherwise. As far as uh, drought, uh, I think a lot of us have learned to live with it. Um, when alfalfa is dry, it grows up, it flowers at a shorter time. Uh, my recommendation, and I apologize ahead of time, Lindsay, this is going to be in inches. <laughs> That's fine. My, my recommendation is um, to cut the alfalfa, frankly, if it's worthwhile harvesting, uh, which is usually about 12 to 14 inches in my mind. Uh, if you don't tarve, if you have less than that and it's usually a little bit thin, then it's probably not worth driving over the field. But also light will get down to the crown and new shoots will come out. And because the uh, drought stressed alfalfa is so uh, high in uh, leaf content, uh, the new growth coming up will still be of reasonable quality. So I encourage people not to be obsessed about cutting the alfalfa just because it's flowering when it's drought stressed. Uh, decide whether or not it's worth harvesting. Other than that, uh, don't have any magic answers. We're going to have all kinds of weather issues. But Well, well, and as you said, well, you know, not every cut is going to be impacted by the same conditions, I would say. And we've got uh, Dear JD uh, in southeastern Quebec saying went from drought in the spring uh, to very wet. Uh, we are having the exact same conditions. We can't go 12 hours without water. Um, let alone trying to find a 48-hour window to make wrapped hay. Uh, so I want to cover a few of those things. I know we've got some slumpy bales that maybe we can look at. Kyler's got a good question here about fundicides, but I want to tackle Michael's first because, Christine, we often talk about trying to get that hay to that that optimal uh, range of, of moisture because, of course, we don't want it too wet. We don't want it too dry when we're going to wrap it. Uh, in dry hay... Uh, in Western Canada, is there a, a pro or con to wrapping dry bales for long-term storage, i.e. two or more years? So this is a good question because what happens if I have dry hay and I wrap it? Is it at all detrimental if it's truly dry hay? Am I running any risks? Christine, I'll ask you and then Dan, if you've got some thoughts. If it's dry hay, that's keeping precipitation off it and that's keeping the bales from sucking up water from the ground due or soil moisture. So, um, yes, you could store dry hay by wrapping it. Uh, Long-term storage gets tricky, though, right? Because that plastic's not really meant to last more than about 12 to 18 months. And so, you, yeah, you are going to get some plastic deterioration. you got to stay on top of rodent damage and bird damage, etc., um, so I'm not sure about long-term storage. The other thing too is, you know, you're not, most people who do decide to wrap dry hay for protecting it from the elements, they're not putting as many layers on as they would if they're making baleage, right? So baleage, it's not as densely packed as haylage in a silo and it's not as wet. So the main preservative in baleage is excluding oxygen, which is why you need like six layers of plastic to make sure that if the outer layer gets a scrape, hopefully that isn't a hole all the way through the plastic. Um, if your bales are actually dry, a lot of people that do wrap their dry hay only put like two layers of plastic on it because plastic is right. expensive. So uh, that makes it a little harder <laughs> to keep that in good shape for 
more than a year and a bit. Mm -hmm. Okay. Ray says, I heard of West Highland Terrier's work on the rodents. My neighbor has a Patterdale Terrier. Amazing. The thing is like eight pounds and it kills rats like you would not believe. It is truly remarkable. However, I don't think we have roving groups of terriers um, on to take to everyone's farm to protect uh, their rat hay from rodent damage. So there you go. Great question, though, from Kyler on fungicides. Um, and I don't even know what's on label. I, I don't know that there's a, a long list for alfalfa. I think there's a, there are a few, sure. Uh, but Dan, have you seen this as uh, an increasing uh, practice? Or do you know of any trials looking at uh, a benefit to fungicide on alfalfa? I think it's, what's the disease we're worried about? There's a couple. Anyway, Dan, yeah. go ahead. We've, we've been doing a lot of research, uh, Minnesota, Wisconsin, some in Michigan, over the last few years looking at fungicides. And the, um, the long and the short of it on alfalfa is that the longer between cuttings, the more beneficial the fungicide is. So if we come in and cut it 28 days, which is kind of an old standard for dairy, it's pretty hard to justify fungicide on a lot of these fields but if we go to 30 or 35 days then it becomes more and more worthwhile especially in humid regions like a lot of eastern canada i would think it would be pretty hard to justify uh, in western canada at all but we are seeing a bunch of this on alfalfa particularly as the harv extra the low quality lignin comes in and and the cutting interval is being extended uh, the comment here about uh, applying in the spring and and affecting uh, nurse crops, I think they got a good salesperson <laughs> to talk so, to them. Well, <laughs> well, now I do know, Kyler, and maybe remind us where you are. I do know, like certainly in Ontario, oats have become, and Christine, this is, I mean, way in Kyler's here. Kyler's in Bruce oats. County. Yeah. Okay, he's in Bruce so, County. So Kyler's in Bruce County. Unless yeah, okay. he's moved, he's in Bruce County. Um, okay. Yeah, so I know a lot of producers really struggle with rust on oats. Oats, yeah. And That's the so issue. It, I, yeah. I think just the way I was interpreting what Kyler had typed, I, I think he's talking about spraying the oats he's using as a nurse crop rather mm -hmm. than seedling alfalfa. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it's, it's tricky because the forage oat varieties have way better regrowth than grain varieties, but the grain varieties tend to have more rust resistance. So right. yeah. it's, and it's not something that we have a lot of trial work on for the forage oats. So right. the best I can tell you right now is pencil it out, is the regrowth on the forage oats worth it to apply the fungicide? Or would you be better off buying a grain? Like if you're only taking one cut, off that annual forage anyway, you don't really need the regrowth on the forage variety. So right. then is it worth it to get a more rust resistant grain variety and take it for forage? I, I can't answer that for you, but those are the things to kind of consider out so, and, and pencil. Yeah. A thought pencil process. Process. I, I think you're I think you're right on, Christine. And uh, my bias would be that buying a rust resistant variety is much more cost effective than spending 25 or 30 dollars per acre for spraying uh, mm -hmm. the other thing that i was going to suggest and and i don't know how much you've done on that but i'm a lot more interested in triticale for example where we have less rust and and good regrowth yeah. uh, and of course he mentioned barley in there perhaps uh, it would be more cost effective to switch the species a little bit and or varieties than it would be to apply fungicide so are, are you point. thinking spring triticale then, Dan? Because I know more Ontario producers are familiar with doing fall. winter triticale. Yeah. 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 You could do, well, um, I guess that's a good question. Kyler, when are you putting it in? This is a question. I want to know. Come on, Kyler. Um, I'm glad you know who it is, Christine, because then we know where he is. Um, so, but it, it is true. It, definitely for for Ontario, I think there's a lot more interest in a winter triticale than than a spring, but there might be room for the spring triticale. Dan, um, because I'm on an ergot kick lately, although this year Touchwood has not been the disaster it was last year, triticale is a cross of wheat and rye developed at the University of Manitoba. I'll have everybody know. Um, does it have 
the ergot risk of rye or wheat or somewhere in between? Does anybody know? I'll put it out there. Um, to be real honest, we haven't seen as much on the triticale just because I think we haven't seen as much triticale. <laughs> Hmm. Um, See, all, that's a legit um, answer. <laughs> <laughs> all of the grass varieties will get ergot. I've seen it on orchard yeah. grass, fescue, oats, uh, wheat. Uh, it's just uh, important to watch for it and deal with it if you have it. And yeah. I will say that it's not very common. Um, I don't know what you're hearing, but I've really only seen two or three cases in the last 20 years. You should have toured one of my pastures last year, Dan. We had horrible ergot and we had lambs losing their ears. So there you go. But it was on pasture. So it wasn't in grain. It was on pasture. And oh my gosh. Anyway, we're not here to talk about that. Uh, but Kyler is in Bruce County um, and uh, he plants early in the spring. So so that's an interesting point then. Then spring triticale could potentially work. But I think, Christine, to your point, uh, if you're only, if it's just a nurse crop and you're only going to take the one cut, maybe the green oat variety with better resistance is the better economic right. versus mm -hmm. having to control the rust. Because rust is a, so Dan, I don't know about in Wisconsin, but here in Ontario, rust and forage oat is like basically a given. Like you can. Can be, it, yeah, can yeah. be a problem. Let, let yeah. me just make one comment back. Uh, what you should have done with the ergot in your field. Uh-huh. <laughs> You can go it's ahead and late, cut yeah. high, and it's only, it's only in the heads. I know. So you can go th through and cut high enough to get the heads in a baler, and just throw those wet bales in a pile, and uh, then you can graze everything underneath that, and it won't have any effect on your animals. Yeah, there's we we've changed a lot of things, but we really didn't. So we we were grazing this particular this particular acre under solar panels. So so could go in between but not all of it um but we just it took us a while to figure out what it was because that was just i'd always thought about it as a grain problem not a forage problem or a pasture problem so it's uh, a grass problem right? and cereals are just annual grasses we've selected for seed production so it's, exactly. yeah i know it sucks Lindsay. So, it really sucks. yeah it does anyway this year's much better touch wood um not perfect but much better okay we have a few minutes left um definitely want to talk about christine you you shared a picture of slumpy bales Tell me the story of the slumpy bales, because we're dealing well, with very, very wet conditions. So how do we now? Yeah, this? so the slumpy bales, and I totally forgot to ask Jay to pull this up earlier. This is some of that may bale hay I was talking about at the beginning, oh. the stuff that I'm worried about spontaneous combustion. Right. So um, these are not actually large square bales. These are bundles of small square bales. So there's oh, those like of you the who little, are familiar. Yeah, yeah like so the bale band thing. Less familiar. Um, it's a lot of labor to do small squares, but there's a lot of demand for small squares. Yeah. So the way that commercial hay growers sometimes get around that is they buy a machine called a bale bundler. And there's a few different brands that make them and they just scoop up all the tiny little square bales and package them into something the size of a large bale so that you can handle it with equipment and make loading trucks easier, et cetera. So these are, these are bale bundles. So there's, I think 21 bales in a bundle and this is some of that may hay. So they um, had that window after other crops went in in the spring. And so they cut some hay and it felt dry and it seemed dry on the outside. And they applied enough acid as if it was 22% moisture because they knew may hay could be tricky. Um, yeah. But it was testing at like 8 to 14, which for a small square bale, they say under 18%, you should be okay. Um, the larger the bales, the lower that moisture content has to be because it, they, they can't breathe as well. They're, they're densely packed, large packages of hay, right? So, um, yeah, so the moisture content seemed fine. They overapplied the acid just to be safe. And uh, when they went to start stacking them in the shed, these, the next morning, these bales are all falling over. And it's because they, the stem moisture didn't have time to come out because that crop was too immature for dry hay when they cut it. So... Um, yeah, this is this is what that slumping looks like. This is why they weren't stacking. They started opening up these bundles and it was sopping wet inside because that wow. stem moisture that hadn't been drawn out during the wilting process or drawn out by the acid was now because it had been packed in a bale and, and it was now starting to come out and just so wet, so, so wet. And actually, Jay, I sent another photo of uh, caramelized hay. 
before wait before we go oh. just um can we go back to the other one for a second because is that a yeah. terrier in that in this no, picture that, that's what a is... cat so, okay i wonder that was one of the barn cats tell. Okay, anyway, back to the caramelized yeah. but, but yeah, so so bales that are slumping, no, that's the sign that they might be too wet. Right. Well, I, I was just going to say, one of the things that I think we really need to be careful about, you're talking about this moisture stem, uh, stem and the moisture and so on, is that with any of these field testing probes, the packing of the hay is crucial to the reading that you get. Mm -hmm. And I see a lot of farmers put a bunch of hay in a bucket and stomp on it and then go stick the probe in there. And that's not good enough. Uh, no. Frankly, the real best test would be to cut a little bit of it and put it in the microwave and dry it down. And then you would, then you wouldn't end up with this moisture in the stem issue. You would know exactly what it was and be able to deal with it. So j just Absolutely. a thought from the side. It's, yeah, I think, and, and uh, like part so some other limitations on the probe is those probes are measuring electrical conductivity. So they're, they're really good at measuring if the crop is wet on the outside. They're not very good at measuring if the crop is dry on the outside and soaking wet on the That's inside. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they're calibrated for a specific bale density, and most of them are calibrated for straight alfalfa. So if you're growing grass hay, that could be out easily by as much as 5%, which is the difference between not bailing and bailing with acid or bailing with acid or bailing without acid. Like 5% uh, yeah. changes the whole thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, so the photo Jay's got up on the screen right now is some caramelized hay. So the outside, like especially that bottom left corner, that's green. Mm -hmm. And then the stuff that's been pulled up from inside the bale in the middle of the photo, that's brown. So that's that Maillard reaction, that heating that I was talking about earlier, where it's caramelizing, just like when you're when you're cooking and your food turns brown. Um, except we don't want that in forage. That's so that this is, is bad non news delicious. This is this non is not delicious. This, this is, is not, not nutritious. Okay. This no, is this is not nutritious because okay. it's tied up the nutrients. And um, if you start reading extension fact sheets and stuff that you know tell you all the signs of like your hay might be heating, they'll say you know if you can smell a musty smell in the hay storage or if you can smell tobacco. And I actually very dislike the comparison to tobacco oh, because okay. anyone about my age automatically thinks cigarettes. Ah, uh, not tobacco. And it doesn't it doesn't okay. smell like cigarettes unless you happen to know someone who buys the paper and the loose leaf tobacco and rolls their own. <laughs> like it smells like burning paper. But like very very few very few millennials know what that loose leaf tobacco burning smell smells like because cigarettes are full of other stuff so they don't right. they don't smell like cigarettes so ignore the whole, all the tobacco references it smells like burning paper or burning leaves okay there um so i just wanted to clarify that because <laughs> i remember before i'd had the experience of smelling burning hay i was very confused by that uh advice as well smell. so it does not right. smell like tobacco it smells like burning paper it means, yeah, tobacco, actual tobacco. Uh, you mm -hmm. should both be very proud of me. I did, when we did actually find a window to make hay, I did actually use my microwave to dry it, to verify. Um, and um, I made a gigantic mess of my kitchen. So thank you, Dan, for that. Um, I have learned lessons and this is why you do it in the shop microwave, but we don't have one. So yes. um, there you go. Uh, Ray has a has a question before we wrap up here, uh, putting it out there. If anyone is doing feed or silage ammoniation out east. Um, so I'll put that question out there if anybody knows of anyone or uh, if anyone's doing that. And Janet mentions ergot uh, affecting rye and triticale grown after wheat. So er I've learned a lot about ergot and rye is very susceptible to it. But as Dan and Christine have shared, uh, ergot is a disease of grasses and that includes our cereals, but it very much includes all of our pasture and our hay grasses as well. So it is definitely a risk, um, especially in certain conditions. Um, that was one of the things that, our, that we, in our research, found uh ergot likes to develop in certain conditions so there you go um okay we are out of time this has been absolutely fantastic um there's probably 10 questions i didn't get to so um i i'm gonna do another forage episode because the questions coming from the audience were absolutely fantastic i appreciate each and every one of them and everyone hopping on i know it's the middle of summer it's maybe not what everybody wants to do 
at eight o'clock Eastern on a Monday. But I appreciate each one of you and especially our guests. So Dan, uh, thank you so much for joining me tonight. This has been absolutely fantastic. You're very welcome. And Christine, thank you as well. And thank you uh, for persevering through great screen grabs of frozen cameras. <laughs> Wonderful. You're welcome. Yes. All pleasure. right. All right. And thank you, of course, to Profitable Practices, to Relag Shops, and to Adama Canada uh, for supporting the show. I'll be back next Monday, 8 p.m. Eastern, live. We're going to talk corn diseases. Uh, we'll see you then. Cheers, everybody. All right.